So we had this webinar yesterday where I talked in detail about introduction to SIM. If you want to make your career into SIM or let's say cyber security, what should be your approach? What should you study? How should you prepare yourself? And then how many domains are there into cyber security where you can potentially make your career, make a living out of it? So that is what we'll talk about today also. That is what we stress about today also. Okay. First of all, a little bit of introduction. So InfoSec Train is one of the finest security training consulting organization. We have been here for a while. We have been here for more than seven, eight years now. We have people who have more than 15 years of industry experience in multiple domains. Let's say if you have a question about penetration testing or vulnerability assessment or CISSP, basically any field into cybersecurity. So we have someone who can help you out with your questions. Right. So that is a small profile introduction about InfoSec Train, how we help people you know, get more knowledge, get more insights into the industry so that they can prepare themselves, they can build more better profile for themselves that will eventually help them and the industry also. Okay. Here are some key announcements or some house rules as we call them. So this session will definitely be recorded and to be available onto the YouTube channel soon. So here is a bit of forward is a small thought which I like to write when I want to start my webinars. This is how I want to, want to introduce. So in this presentation, we'll briefly discuss on some pointers about SIM. Now, I won't be going into the depth of SIM, how it works fundamentally, what are the core functionalities, what are the services which can you know, comprise of SIM, but we'd rather be on a very generic level. We'd have a bird's eye view today about SIM. We talk from process perspective rather, rather than the technology's perspective. We talk about cyber security, you know, how many wings are there? What skills do you need? How should you approach your career into cyber security? And all those things. So I hope this will be a very interesting conversation. Uh, towards the conversation, I will share some stories with you. Now, please understand that all the views that I have presented or I'm going to present in this webinar are my own. They might differ with some of the industry leaders or industry practitioners, right? So everybody has their own opinion. I have gathered some knowledge in the last five, six years, which I have worked. So according to that, I will present my ideas and views. That is my projection, right? So as I said, we are going to discuss him on a very high level today. We'll also have another session where we'll you know, deep dive into SIM. That's another session that's going to start from 19th. If anybody's interested, you can reach out to the you know, InfoSec team and then they'll help you out with it. All right, on to the agenda now. There are four things that we'll talk about today. First and foremost is the defense in depth model or how people call it the layered security model, right? Then we'll talk about the red team and the blue team. And there are several other colors which I want to talk about. The third topic is what's a SIM basically. And then fourth is the attack matrix and how can it help? And then finally, we'll, we'll have an open mic session we'll, where we'll take your questions. They could be anything from this presentation or out of this presentation also. That is towards the end. But in between, just please make sure that your questions are from this slide or from everything that I'm speaking. Okay, so first of all, defense in depth. Let's understand this. Let's take an example of a fort, or rather, let's take an example of a kingdom. Imagine there's a kingdom. Once upon a time, far, far away, there was a land which was ruled by a king. So he, he had his kingdom to him, but then there were adversaries who wanted to rule him out of his kingdom and who wanted to do malicious activities, you know, into his kingdom. So now it's his moral duty to protect his people, right? It's the king's moral duty. For that, he has to set up the defense in depth. So let's understand it through the story that the king had the job to protect his people. And in order to do that, he had to set up some defenses into his kingdom. First and foremost, what do you think would be the first defense or the first level of defense that a king has to set up? Of course, he has to secure the perimeter, right? What I mean by that is, the outermost boundary of the kingdom that is to be secured first of all so that they are immune from the threats coming from different states from different lands right how do you set up a perimeter you set up a perimeter with let's say a firewall firewall is a prime example which works as your perimeter defense there are other things like network ids and network ips which work on your perimeter pretty well then there are your web application firewalls right just correlate these defenses from the story to the technical scenario and then you'll have is all very clear okay so the ministry of the king they went to him and said that dear sir handling the security is a multi-faceted affair then the king said what do you mean by that then the ministry said that you have to set up different types of defenses securing the perimeter itself would not help the king became curious he said 
okay but care to explain i think that if we secure the perimeter we are good then the ministry said or then the wise people in the ministry said that no it is just not enough why because there are numerous threat actors working at different layers to take an example you have secured your perimeter and how do you do that let's say the king said i need 100 people standing outside the perimeter looking outside towards the jungle so that nobody comes in running from the jungle and then destroys my kingdom that is done so that is job well done but what about the people who are already inside your kingdom your perimeter depends would have no view inside your network is that a problem yes definitely right that's a different angle it's a different view understand it from you know if you want to imagine cyber security or the matter of cyber security imagine a three dimensional cube in your head yeah so a three dimensional cube has six sides different sides what you see in front of you is just one side let's say you are a firewall expert or you are an antivirus expert or you know you are a database monitoring expert any of these technologies any of these one technologies that you know very well and you think that i know this very well i think i know cyber security well not really because in order to protect an asset you have to set up different defenses how do you do that or what does it mean let's see that let's go back into our example or our story so 100 men set up looking outside towards the jungle so all good what about the people who are already inside the kingdom there are three villages in in the kingdom and then those needs to be protected themselves how do you do that you set up some people inside your villages inside your network that's your network security so is that different from perimeter security yes well technically the tools and technologies will be the same the scope however will change how the scope will change well the 100 people will be separated by a very big wooden gate which will differentiate people from inside to outside so those 100 men have no visibility inside those villages but they can see the view outside so they will protect you from the internet threat from threat coming in from the jungle right okay that is great now the network security you set up patrolling stations into your villages you set up some men with it and then you say that you five people look at the village one five people look at the village two and village three that is great but then what about the individual houses you set up one police station into one village but then does it have coverage to all the houses well not really there are only five people stationed so they can work on the routes they can look at the roads inside the village and then they can see if something is happening on the road itself but not inside the house yeah there you need host security how do you do that so people will lock their home people will you know hire somebody let's say a bodyguard or a personal guard to guard their house or their host that is host security right now things are getting interesting so this is what the wise people said to the king that do you understand now sir that not only men are needed outside our perimeter but also inside the villages and some people who have very important information with them in their house they need their house to be protected as well that is host based security he said okay now i'm starting to get this idea of defense in depth or layered security and how is it important now the application security let's say your house is secure somebody is sitting outside your house guarding both the routes you know east and west nobody can come in without his admission that is great but what about it somebody who you trust who has access to your house not only your house but to your different rooms there is a living room bedroom dining room and kitchen he or she has access to all of those rooms when you are not present when you are not looking he or she can go into one of the rooms and then he might steal some important thing how do you monitor that you set up application layer security or you set up internal cameras inside your house to protect your rooms yeah inside a house there are different rooms so inside a host there are different applications okay and again going to the deepest level inside your bedroom there would be a locker inside that locker there would be money there would be jewelry and all those things which is your important data now technically speaking all that important thing is data data is the new fuel as you know right so data needs to be protected as well at the data security layer that is where data security comes into play the tools to be used is dlp encryption hashing and all those things right not going into the technical tools and details now just giving you the idea of defense in depth so this is the conversation that the ministry of wise men had with the king and then they explained that why defense in depth is needed so only stationing five people outside your perimeter would never be enough you need to cover all the threat vectors you need to cover all the areas from a, from where an attack can come in 
okay so the king was convinced and he said fine let's set this up so that we feel more secure so that is how we explain defense in depth into cyber security coming on to the technical part you need to cover your perimeter this is where your assets talk to the internet then if you go inside your network there are your internal networks divided into separate vlans provided different private ips but then one vlan needs to talk to other vlan in order to share some data that also needs to be protected inside one particular network there are different hosts let's say servers or laptops or printers or web cameras whatever right so those are host or in general called asset in an organization what's an asset asset is typically anything which holds important information which can be used right so asset in general is anything which you see inside an organization which can be leveraged to send and receive information let's say your laptop a server you know, a router a switch an access point anything then inside the server or inside your laptop there are different applications and then all the application have their own sensitive data depending upon the nature of the application so that is why you need defense in depth also not to mention if you want to be very good into cyber security you need to touch bases on all these five layers at least you should know the basics of all these layers what tools are used to protect us at all these layers what techniques are used what protocols do they work on so all those basic things this is something that i'll stress upon as we go forward also i would like some questions right this becomes very necessary to know what's your playground if you want to be into cyber security so this becomes mandatory to know what all things you can do how many domains you can explore consider this as a tree where there is the core trunk is the cyber security domain which you see in the dead middle and then there are all these branches rooting out in different colors okay let's take one one branch at a time let's try and understand what these bubbles are actually what is written so as i said this is a bird's eye view also not to mention this is not the only representation of cyber security there could be numerous others this is what i found and this is what i thought is relatable and that is why we have kept it in the slide okay now as we know that different people come from different backgrounds they have different experiences with them different aptitude different skills and different ambitions as well right so depending upon what's the nature of the job that you like to do the most you have to choose this branch right my advice here would be please do not go for a job which you think is very hot in the market right now but something that you do not relate yourself for instance let's say you are a very good bug bounty hunter or penetration tester or malware researcher or some something of that sort but all you see right now in the market is SOC L1, SOC L2, SOC engineer, SOC this and that. Please do not opt for a job just for the sake of the frequency of the job is more. Yeah, Just because you see that this job is more and more and then this will give me some money. Let's go for it. I think that'd be a very big you know, mistake in your career. Why am I saying that is you'll get that job. Sure, you'll get you'll start to earn money as well. But what will happen three months, six months, 10 months down the line? right you'll start feeling lethargic why because you simply do not like that domain at your core so you'll start to lose interest and then you would have two choice one go back to what you are doing you know basically before this job or two carry on in this field and try to put your heart into it but that is very unlikely so that is why i'm saying that invest your time into what you want to do Money is a factor which will come around, not immediately, but definitely. And once it starts to turn around for you, if you have good skill, if you have good experience, then money would not be a problem. It will just go out of the equation. Trust me. This is my first experience. Keep on doing what you want to do, what you love to do, and then money will come around. Not immediately, but definitely. Okay. So if you're starting into cyber security, let's see. Depending upon what's your nature. So note this down and ask yourself this after this webinar that are you a kind of person who likes to investigate into things do you have that investigative nature if yes incident response digital forensic penetration testing this is something that you should do are you somebody who wants to solution who wants to provide solution to problems if yes then security engineering is a field which you can see on your top left or in a domain this is something that where you should go because therein all you have to do is create solution for people. People have problem at different levels. Let's say they need their data to be protected. They need their network to be designed. They need cloud security, right? They need system integrations and all those things. So if you like to solution things, then this is something that you should opt for. If you say that I'm a kind of a person who is a very good advisor, 
I can hear people. I can understand the problem. I can devise a solution and then I can advise them on to it. Then GRC is something that you should explore. GRC basically is governance, risk and compliance. The green branch that you see on your right. So that is something that where you should go. So depending upon your nature, what you want to do, what you like to do, you should take up your branch and then decide your career rather than just going for the job which is there in the market. Yeah. And there is a lot of things that you can do, you know, take out any of these branches. And then if you talk about any of these one bubbles, you can make your careers into it. Let's say if you take the yellow, yellow branch, which goes to security operation, which is down below to your left, then security branch, a security operation further branches out to a lot of things. Let's say SIM, vulnerability management, SOC, DLP, incident response, where you can then again you can do investigations and all those things, right? Let's say you go into SIM. See, SIM is just one bubble out of all these all these bubbles, right? And then you can take one bubble and then make your career into it. You want you can become an expert into it. Spend time into it, then become expert. Once you feel that you are comfortable enough into one thing, then probably you can start working on second thing in parallel. There's no harm in that, right? But then just make sure that uh, you follow a T-type structure for your career. Uh, this is an advice which I received. So that is why I'm sharing it with you guys that a T type structure is basically imagine the letter T in your head. So there is this horizontal bar and then in the middle, there's this vertical bar, right? So if I'll just explain the letter T, the horizontal bar shows the diversity of the knowledge that you possess. What I mean by that is, you know, the diversity could be like, I know cryptography, and then I know GRC, I know auditing, I know SOC, threat intelligence, and all those things, right? So I know 10 different domains. That's my diversity. But in the middle, the vertical line shows that what is the technology that you are an expert in, okay? Let's say my technology is SIM, QRadar, SOC, you know, anything, any one thing that you think that you are very comfortable in. You, this is your forte, you're an expert here. This is your playground. And you can answer any of those questions. If you don't follow this structure, what's going to happen is in any of those interviews, you would not be able to talk at length on any of those topics. Right? Well, not only that, in your career also, the most important question is why should we hire you? So following a T-type structure helps you answer that question in the sense that you can say that I know 10 different things at beginner or intermediate level while there is one thing which I am an expert at. So hire me for this one thing while I can look at all the other things as well. This would be an answer to the question of why we should hire you. So if you're planning for an interview recently or if you have an interview scheduled, this is something that you can take with you. Okay. So prepare yourself in such a way that you can say that I know 10 different things at beginner level or intermediate level. And then there's one thing where I have specialized. So if you want to ask deep questions, technical questions, lengthy questions, let's go to that domain where I can justify myself. But yeah. If you want to stay at the conceptual level, then I can talk in 10 different domains, right? So that helps the interviewer give a very good visibility into what you know and how he can work with you. So that increases your chances very rapidly rather than just you know, trying to answer every question. I think this helps a lot. Okay, so this is the overview or this is the bird eye view of what you can do into cybersecurity, right? Just make sure you see all these bubbles, at least read what's written into all those bubbles. Just be aware of what all things are there, what all domains are there, what all possibilities at least are there, which you can explore. And then it's up to you what you want to do, really. So if you're searching for penetration testing, it's on your right, the top right. Risk assessment then branches out to penetration testing. And then inside that you have white box, black box, gray box, and all those things. So if you want to be ethical hacker, that's the domain which you should go for. And then on your bottom left, you have security operations. It's also called SecOps or obviously security operation where you have all these operation things into different layer. There's network security, there's host security and all those things, right? In parallel, there is career development. There is user education. Again, a very, very interesting domain. Conventional thought was you have to work as a cybersecurity engineer somewhere. Or, or an auditor somewhere or a penetration tester somewhere. That's it. Yeah. But then now people are also opting for a teacher or an educator, a cybersecurity educator. That's also one domain which can give you a lot of money. If you have interest towards educating others, if you have interest towards spreading awareness, this is one thing that you can do. You need not be a same expert or a 
penetration tester or a top level hacker to earn a good amount of money you can also talk to people educate them on the basic concepts and then that can also generate a lot of revenue for you so that is also one thing which i don't think a lot of people even consider to try and be a tutor or something like that. all right now that we have understood the basic domains of cyber security let's take a look at red and blue which is, which sort of has been you know a very conventional way to look into cyber security so cyber security is mostly red and blue but now they have evolved to some other teams which will be in the next slide right so but before going on to that let's discuss red and blue so here are some questions for you so it says which side are you on what's the area of interest and how do you feel about the cyber world if i were to explain that which side are you on is again something which i was just stressing upon in the last slide while i was saying that what is the core nature of your interest right let's say if you are somebody who likes to you know get into the core of the things let's say if i have given you an application and then what you would do is you start reviewing the source code the first thing that you do is you open that application in your debugger and you start reviewing the source code you find out 10 vulnerabilities come back to me say that okay i think this application will break if we put it on the internet somebody will hack it very quickly right why can i say that because i reviewed the source code here are the top 10 problems the authentication is broken sometimes you expect very very small strings in password which need not to be complex that is a problem there are hard coded credentials into your code that is another problem and the authentication is sometimes broken also the pages also do not stitch together very neatly right so you come up to me with all these vulnerabilities saying that the source code has a lot of problem right that's the offensive approach yeah or that's the investigative approach so a red team is something that you should opt for or should go for if your natural aptitude is towards it right if i ask you a simple question what do you want to do if you are selected for let's say a, a big four into cyber security team and if your answer is something like i would like to take a look at all the existing logging mechanism and see how their defenses are put up what is the level of logging that they are doing i want to review them if i find something interesting i want to report it to make the policies more stringent more policies more better so i think then defenders or the blue teamers you no know, is something that you should opt for right so as i said i have always been a fan of the defensive side the defenders i started my careers with the firewall security team then i was moved on to the antivirus security team and then i was moved on to the sim team the soc team so i've been in all those teams i have seen how the tools work how they protect the organization against the threats that fascinates me that's pretty interesting that is one side of the coin the other side obviously is try and hack into the organization once you are able to do it create a report and then send it out to the officials saying that okay there is a potential problem in your organization i just hacked it and you should resolve this problem right that is what an ethical hacker does so if you want to do that if you want to try and exploit things then i think red teaming is something that you should opt for so again how do i decide which team should i go for or bigger question is can i only be a part of one team absolutely not you can do everything in all these these teams okay it just depends on how much time do you have at your hands there's only so much that you can learn information is not a problem not anymore since we are running on the internet since everything is available on the internet getting the information is not a problem the problem really is one do you have that much of time at your hands second are you willing to spend that time with a focused mind because you only have so much distractions with you no uh, it's not possible to just read about everything reading is one thing and then ingesting that data into your mind then getting to know that and then practicing it in the real world that is the most difficult part right but having said that nobody is stopping you from trying to learn black box testing and social engineering and web application security along with the defensive security or incident response okay. so yesterday's webinar there was a question what is the most paying job or the most paying role out of everything that is written in this red team and blue team one of the top paying roles is the incident response role you know in uk in australia in america they give a lot of money to a top level incident responder so the payment is very high for an incident responder provided 
you have the skills the aptitude if you go to the red teaming side web application security is something which gives you a lot of revenue in terms of bug bounty right so there are a lot of challenges which you can solve and through them you can earn a lot of money this is not available with the blue team not from the revenues perspective but yes you can still go for ctf which is catch the flag and as you catch the flag you learn a lot about the operating systems that is a fun way to learn but there is nothing in terms of revenue right another we have talked from revenues perspective let's talk from technologies perspective or interest perspective right if you were to ask me that what is one of the most interesting roles into this red team and blue team the first thing that comes into my mind since i am a blue teamer is threat hunting threat hunting is very interesting if you start doing it you would not be able to stop yourself but there is a way to hunt for threats to understand what threat hunting let's go back to our kingdom let's go back into our example so here's the situation you have set up all your defenses everything is good now there is this intelligence which is delivered to the king that there are some crude warriors who are hiding into the jungle just not coming out in the daylight they will attack or they plan to attack in the night how do we resolve this problem the king has this intelligence that something bad is hiding into the jungle they don't know what because they are not coming out and the defenses which are set up outside the perimeter let's say there are a lot of archers there are you no know, men on horses there are elephants there are cannons set up but they cannot move into the jungle they are stationary so what can they do they cannot just sit and wait because in the night time you no know, let's say the adversaries can see clearly in the night while the defenses cannot the point that i'm trying to make is there are ways to bypass our defense mechanisms so if we wait for the adversary to reveal themselves then there might be a problem that we might get hacked with a zero day or something like that and won't even know why because we are stationary and trying to you know wait for the attack to come to us so the king says enough now let's take the fight to them we are not going to wait any more for them to come to us we know that there are adversaries into the jungle i want to clean that jungle out of the adversaries how do i do that he set up a team of five people who are very skilled he gave them full authority to do whatever they want to do and then he sent them into the jungle so this is what hunting is actually you do not wait for the malware to come to you you try and search for the malware into your organization question is how do you do that so in the same fashion how you know the hunters did for the king they made a strategy okay we want to cover this jungle fairly quickly so we'll split up and then we'll cover more distance through this and then this is our strategy this is how we are going to do the damage control and so on and so forth right so you have to create a strategy okay two pointers what helps and what does not help during threat hunting do iocs help yes at certain level mostly not because iocs are anyway integrated into your sim into your next generation firewall into your edrs and all those things right if they were to help they would have helped already that is the point so what does help reading about an adversary helps and searching for ttps rather than iocs helps there are indicators of compromise and then there are techniques tactics and procedures right so there's a very popular concept of pyramid of pain if you'll just look that up pyramid of pain it starts at the very basic level the most basic level is the iocs the ip addresses the urls the deem domain names file names hashes which are readily available everywhere right so that tells us that once they are readily available they are of less worth why because everybody already has those values why would somebody who would be a smart hacker use something like that which is already available on the internet makes no sense right so what you have to look for is ttps what's a ttp let's say there is an apt28 malware which is also known as the polar bear i'm just quoting an example okay the polar bear malware campaign is from north korea what it does it sends out its malware on fish, through phishing emails once you open up that excel it has a macro once you enable that macro it runs a vbs code or visual basic code wherein it invokes a powershell and through that powershell it downloads the malware that is the all procedure yeah now you know it okay once you know it you can search for specific things like let me know whenever there is a visual basic script triggered after the execution of an excel 
So you can make sequence. So Excel opened, then macro was enabled, then PowerShell was invoked, then there was a network connection made outside of the organization. If all these four steps are hit, then I know there's a malware. And on the basis of that, give me an offense. That is threat hunting, okay? A very, very important domain, a very, very interesting domain. This is where you can research a lot. This is almost similar to malware research. Only difference is if you want to go into malware research, you have to know at least two, three types of coding languages. Python wherever is the must. Java, JavaScript is the second. And then C would be the third. But if you want to do threat hunting, you need not be a programming expert. Digital forensics, again, a very interesting uh, use case, a very interesting domain into blue teaming, right? A digital forensic expert is like, a private investigator who's assigned a case, let's say CBI. CBI is our assigned case that something terrible has happened. We want to know how did it happen? How did the accident took place? So that is what CBI does. Looks for clues and then paints the bigger picture. That is what you will do digitally. So that is what digital forensics is. Right. So red team versus blue team, both are great. Both are equally awesome. It's just the matter of your fascination and your interest, what you want to do, what interests you, right? Based on that, you should advance in your career. That is the advice from this slide. All right, just make sure that you remember our example, our story of the kingdom and how it needs to be protected at different levels and what the king is willing to do for the protection of his kingdom, right? He has just sent, in the latest episode, he has just sent a hunting party into the jungle. Yeah, and he has all those defenses set up at different levels. Great. And we can also incorporate red team and blue team into the same example. If you wish to discuss that, then I can do that. As well. Right. More teams. First question is, why is this slide here? Why is this slide here? So I just wanted you guys to be aware of what's going on in the industry. It's just not limited to blue team and red team. In my earlier comment, I said that the most conventional way to divide cybersecurity was red and blue. But then, as the teams evolved or as the process matured, they, they had this necessity of having smaller teams so that they can have segregation of duty. Segregation of duty is something which a lot of frameworks demand out of the box. Let's say there's a PCI DSS framework which is mandatory for all the organization which deal with credit cards. So if you are an industry who is using credit card sensitive information, you should comply to PCI DSS. PCI DSS has a lot of controls. One of the controls is you should have segregation of duty placed. What segregation of duty that? One person cannot do everything, simply put. That is SOD. The same person cannot be your antivirus guy and firewall guy and same guy, right? There should be three people or at least three IDs digitally who are used or which are used to log in. Why? Because it gives a lot more credibility, one, and then it, it gives a lot more space for the investigation. If there is anything bad that has happened, it gives a lot more space for the investigation so that you can pinpoint on one particular ID. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to know who did the bad thing, right? Because ultimately it's the same person who's using the firewalls, the antivirus, the SIM, the IDS, the IPS, everything. So you would not be able to know. So the basic controls are the ID should not be shared. One person should not have access on multiple things. Also, the password should be rotated in all those things, right? The same idea is derived to make different teams from blue and red. Let's say there's a purple team or there's a green team. What's a green team? So green team has everything to do with you know, uh, the secure design of the code, right? So they have to make sure that the code is tested before it is released into the production. It does not have any vulnerability, you know, it does not have any gaps, it does not have any problems and all those things. So do you require a separate team for that? Well. No, initially, but then, as I said, this is all subject to the maturity of the framework or the maturity of the security posture in your organization. So eventually you'd go out, uh, you start out with blue and red, at least you start with the blue team. The red team initially are hired at temporary basis. Yeah? It, they are hired on contractual basis in every six months or one year. They, they come in, run some tests, and then they, they, they give the reports and then go out. This is how the process is initially. But as they as they mature themselves, they hire red teamers to be a part of their permanent process, internal process. And then they sort of expand to purple team, green team, yellow, and all those things, right? So orange team, what it does, internal user education, 
as I was answering to one of the Rajat's question, that what is the core responsibility of a SOC analyst? Again, as you can see from this wheel, it could be from the blue team's side, but not limited to it. You could also have to do the green team work, the orange team work, and the purple team work. So again, it is subject to what is the scope of your client, how many people do you have in the team, and then how you structure your team also. That is also a very important thing, how you structure your team. So your team could have two different sets of different people or one subset of you know different technologies incorporated into your main team. Or they, they can just have one big team of 10 or 12 or 15 people who can do multiple things or who are multi-scaled. Yeah? So that is two ways to do it. So it, it is subject to your approach, actually. And then there is a white team also in the middle, as you can see, who take care of the compliances, the logistics, and the management, the internal GRC. Yeah. So in the left side, as you can see, this is a logical separation, merely a logical separation. You'll not see an ad somewhere that, uh, you know, a company is hiring for a green team or a company is hiring for an orange team. But then this is just, if you, you know happen to come across any of those posts. So I just wanted to let you know that you guys do not get surprised. Right? There's a full blog onto it. Uh, there's this hyperlink at the last. If you just click on that hyperlink, it will take you to a post where you can read more about these things. So this is just theoretical and just for your knowledge, just for your information. All right. On to the sim now. Now we have established the foothold into cybersecurity. We know our way around basic cybersecurity, the layers of security, the layer defense system, and all those things. So let me ask you a question. Where do you think sim will fit in? Would it fit in into the perimeter security, the network security, the host side of it, the application or the data security? Okay, so they are quite right. Let's understand something which is called active and passive defense or also known as proactive slash reactive defense, right? So let's take an example. Um, so again, let's go back to the same kingdom. So there'd be two types of defenses. One would be the active defense, which will be, let's say the archers, what they'll do. They'll shoot an arrow to anything which starts running into their direction, which seems hostile, right? That is the active defense. So they'll aim onto that person or that thing and then shoot an arrow. That is an active defense. What could be a passive defense? A passive defense could be as simple as a booby trap, right? So there's a pit which they have created and then they have covered it with grass. So somebody who's running into that direction, if he's not cautious enough, he would fall into that pit. So the pit itself is not doing anything, right? The person has to interact with it or stand onto it or step onto it and they'll fall into it, right? That is how the passive defense works. They are still defense, but then they are not doing anything onto their own. Understood? Now, let's translate into cybersecurity. Active defense, firewalls, IPS. Passive defense, IDS. So how is IDS a passive defense and IPS an active defense? If you guys know about IDS slash IPS, you know that they work on two modes. One, inline mode. Second, promiscuous mode or read-only mode. The inline mode is like there's a circuit. There's a let's imagine a very small circuit, okay, which is which only has one switch, right? And then there is one bulb. What happens if you close that switch? The current flows through the circuit and then the bulb is lit. Very simple. Yeah. What happened if you cut that circuit in half with a scissor? Right? There is no more flow of the current, right? That is how you have actively interrupted the communication. That is active defense, right? What could be promiscuous mode? There is one parallel line, which is just taking the current in parallel, which is not messing up with the main network, which is just taking the current as a copy, right? So promiscuous mode is like, you have a switch, there is a tap port, there is one specific port on every switch, which is called a tap port. If you plug into that port, what it will give? It will give all the packets which are flowing through the switch to you separately as a copy. What benefit would you, would you have? You would not interrupt into the active communication. So you will not drop any of this production communication. You will also get to analyze all those logs, right? That is how you passively record or analyze data. Now, so IDS becomes a passive defense and IPS becomes an active defense. SIM is a passive measure of defense, okay? So once we have understood active and passive measure of defense, let's see where SIM fits in into all those five layers. Okay, so 
if anyone has worked on sim here they know that sim can ingest any sort of data any type of data as soon as i say any type of data you guys know it already that it works on all the five layers but let's explore it so with sim you can ingest your firewall logs that's perimeter and network your antivirus logs that's host your web application logs that's application and then you can also ingest all the file level you know encryption and all those things if you are doing data masking data encryption uh, database activity monitoring is going on dam right so all those events can also be incorporated into your sim or if you have data classification turned on or if you have data leak prevention implemented in your organization that's data protection so input from all these is collected onto the sim correlated parsed normalized and all those things happen at the sim level right so sim essentially works at none of these layers and works at all of these layers so this is the answer why did i say it works on none of these layers because it does not do anything by itself it's not an active measure and then why did it say that it works on all the layers because it can listen to all these data from all these layers and then work on to it so understand sim as a dumb device which will not do anything by itself so like the pit we have just created for the adversaries so everybody who is running into the pit they will fall for sure but the pit itself will not do anything yeah? it will just remain idle so sim remains idle unless you send some data towards it it will not do anything that is why it's a passive measure and that is how it does not work on any of these layers actively okay so what's a sim anyway the full form of sim is security information event and event management as soon as i say it's a management software you know that okay that means it will store a lot of data and then process it some sort of tool which can store and process data why because it's essentially management right the word is there in the abbreviation itself well you are right what sort of management management of information and event what sort of information and event security sort of information and event so very simple it has to do with security first thing what into cyber security or security information and event gathered collected and sent to sim for management let's not understand more into management let's first understand information and event so information is anything you know any piece of data which is flown from one place to other place which generates a string of code it's an information right information is always intelligent and then what's an event people can conf get confused into information and events they are essentially the same thing well yes and no they are essentially made of the same substance data how they are different event is something which is of more important right let's say somebody logged in into a computer okay you get an information somebody logged out of the computer you get an information but then if there are multiple login failures that's an event you understand the difference so it's like somebody is trying to knock at the gate you open the gate then they enter you get the information that somebody has entered into the house that's okay in the same fashion somebody got out of the house by opening the door you have the information but then there is this second use case that somebody is barging into the door somebody is just banging onto the door trying to come in and the door is not opening that's an event why because it gives you more sensitive information somebody might be trying to brute force his way into the house so that becomes an event so there are two parts of it one is information second is event now any one of you can have this question that okay i understand the relevance of the event why do we need information it can simply be discarded why do we need all that information we just need the important information which is an event well you are right then it becomes subject of use case of siem so siem was created to solve a basic problem of log management if you are seeing the last line which says how did we get here it says we started with log management so earlier when the it was evolving around 2000 2001 then people realized that the infra becomes really big we need to have one solution where we can park all our logs so that we have visible into what is going on at the logging level or what is going on you know from the activities perspective so they needed to have come up with some sort of log management solution right because still everybody was logging their events onto their machines but it was not enough because there was no central visibility 
so they needed to have a central log management solution that was done but then soon people realized that there are two categories of information one is informational level second is event level right so sim and sem was invented these were two actual solutions sim's job was to prepare a company for an audit this was the complete purpose and sem's job was to look at all these important events to know why they were there and then what is the relevance of them and all those things but there was a problem again there were two solutions which was becoming hectic to handle so people thought let's combine it make it a combo and then come up with something called siem which will serve both the purposes one investigate on the important events why did something bad has happened second also collect the information for the audit purpose so that if some auditor comes tomorrow and says that show me the logs for the last 10 months or 12 months we should be able to show this that is the use case of siem security information management and sem of course is into the investigative part so together they are called siem right now you know the history of siem how did it come into being and what is the use of siem and sem okay so one is the audit purpose the forensics purpose and second is the hunting purpose or the investigation purpose right now this is the technical history of siem let me give you another view of understanding siem okay to make you understand what an siem does fundamentally let's consider a second example of a college okay let's say you are pursuing your bachelor's and then you are into your sophomore you are into your second year okay so there has to be a scheduled internal exam where the office of the college has this responsibility to publish a list of people who have their attendance less than 75% and ultimately they will be debarred from their exam now this is the objective so how does the office achieve that let's look into it i know you guys already know it but let's see how does it correlate with sim and let me try and explain it so that you understand what a sim does fundamentally so let's say there are six subjects and there are 60 students in one batch whose attendance has to be collected okay step 1 the office will reach out to all the teachers or the lecturers and then ask for their individual attendance records for the classes they'll hand it over now data is gathered from all those six subjects for all those 60 students it will be collected and aggregated aggregation is for each student there will be an aggregation of his individual score yeah in terms of present present yeah so second step would be correlation or relating it with the baseline what's the baseline we know that the baseline here is 75% so there is only a yes and no now yes the attendance of this individual is above 75 no it's below 75 based on that the office can take an intelligent decision of either allow or disallow that student from appearing into the exam so in three simple steps they have done what a sim does actually now if you look at the boxes in the images the data collection the primary part the first part this is what we have just discussed right servers network devices these are the subjects the six subjects aggregation of data the second step that we discussed create an aggregation for each student so that profiling is done for each student analyze normalized data for anomalies threats and trends this is where we create a baseline which is 75% we already have individual percent for all the 60 students all we have to do is correlate it right and then with a simple correlation there will be a difference either one individual has more than 75% or less than 75% yeah? after that we'll get alerts that from 60 students we have five students who have more less than 75% so we'll have five alerts for five different users after that we'll investigate alert well this is not required in the college level but yeah if we continue in the same journey if you have related the pieces together now let's continue on the base that we have built that we investigate the alerts that something bad has happened let's say multiple login failures or multiple session denies or malware seen on the asset something like that which identifies a breach and then we can take corrective action on that now the story does not end here this is this is the sem part the event management part right the information part is there in the last block you know where you run the reports and then make make it compliant according to the frameworks that you are following that is the information part sim 
right so all together it is s i e m so i hope it is pretty clear now with the example which i have given of the office for any college if you'll think it over in your mind i think it would be very clear for you how an office works before scheduling an exam that is the same way how an s i e m can work for you just replace the subject with the data endpoints and then everything else works out really fine okay so in this slide we have talked about sim how it works its journey how it came into being what's the definition of sim what is it work what is its relevance great so i hope it is clear yes right so on to the next discussion a lot of people in an organization say that well what i think is i don't really need a sim this is a very real, real situation a lot of people actually say this that i have these other solutions i have edr i have my perimeter devices set and everything do i really need a siem so the answer is yes you do and then here's here's why okay 64% of security admins say that they need a security intelligence platform to collaborate on security data and combat the threats or the attacks be very mindful that the keyword here is collaborate so collaboration is something which all these fantastic devices cannot do on their own okay now let's take an example or let's go back to our kingdom to explore more how the story progresses okay so fine so the king has all these defenses set up at different levels and then he says that okay i don't think that i need one central body which can take care of all my defenses and then log all the details i don't simply need that so the wise people say that okay let's explain so the first question is all your defenses have their own intelligence built in the king says yes they do fine so as long as there is intelligence there would be one gray area for all of them where they cannot decide either something is truly bad or not truly malicious or not the king says yes obviously there would be a gray area so the wise people say that this is where we want help of a central body so the king says okay can you explain again right so the the ministry says that let's say if there is an adversary who came walking in into our kingdom and the perimeter defenses failed to identify him as an adversary why they were suspicious about him but then that suspicion was not confirmed so could happen possible the king said yes it's possible so he said that okay that adversary walked right through our perimeter defenses in the hood and then our perimeter defenses failed to identify him as a threat they did notify that his he should be checked but then he was released under some suspicion so his job is done he has broken into the perimeter defense now he would do the same thing into the network defense the host defense based on how vigilant are these guys at the different defense levels he may or may not be able to get past them the point is as long as they don't pass this information on to the other checkpoints we would still fail the king says yes i think that makes sense only if the intelligence from the firewall that i see somebody who's logging in but it is suspicious was passed to the host defenses then we would have a more secure security posture wouldn't you say so so the king says yes i think it makes sense that we share threat intelligence but how do we do that that is where the ministry said we need a central body wherein we can combine all that intelligence from all the defenses and then based on that we can take actions so now we can minimize the area where the threat can travel freely without being noticed why because we have data coming in from all the defenses from the perimeter the network the endpoint the application and the data right so the king says yes i think that makes a fair sense uh, so let's go and set this up so it's the same thing in cyber security world let's say your firewall allows a session from an outside ip to your internal network it has an ips ids built in but the ids is set to alert the traffic and not to block the traffic yeah so the firewall is doing its job it's alerting but then the question is what do you do with that alert the firewall administrators might not be able to work with that alert due to the scarcity of time and resources also notice that without sim that alert will not be shared with anybody so that intelligence is lost agreed yes again in the second layer the network firewall will again raise some suspicion but then that intelligence will be lost again if there is no central threat intelligence sharing mechanism or some some sort of sim now same thing will happen on an endpoint let's say an endpoint identified something as a malware 
it did not have enough confidence onto the malware so it did not block it but it did send out an alert for the analyst for review it is the same ip which downloaded the malware but then who is going to connect these dots nobody can do that because these intelligence are kept separate at different level right so that is why you need some sort of platform where you can pull in all these data and then analyze it once you do it you can call this out there right so that is why you need a sim a central mechanism where you can pull all the data and analyze it based on that you can take an action so let me know if the example was not clear uh, all right so moving on is the relevance of sim let's see some of the capabilities of sim so the main feature of sim why you buy it obviously is threat detection because you have multiple input source you can do the investigations and then you can reduce your time to respond this is very critical when it comes to malware outbreak ransomware outbreak a zero day exploit so having a sim really helps because you have reduced the time to respond how because you have threat intel coming in from one place you have firewall data coming in from second place you have endpoint data coming in from third place if you have an intelligent rule set up you'll get an alert within seconds that something bad is happening and proactively you can stop it that is how you reduce the time to respond now this is the main feature of sim can it do something else for you yes you can do a lot of advanced threat detection that is your threat hunting space that is where you can do your threat hunting based on different apts different iocs or ioas right indicators of attack which is slightly advanced concept than indicators of compromise you can do the forensics here you can do the incident response from here obviously it does the collection and and all those things right so of course the basic security monitoring can also be set up on top of these things here from sim so as you can see sim is one place which not only gives you visibility into your infrastructure from log standpoint but it also opens workspace of threat hunting for you wherein you can research for something which is missed by the tools threat hunting basically starts where everything from the tools perspective gets over right so you are essentially searching for something which the tools have missed so you are being the wiser here so that is the capability of sim it's a very capable technology it does a lot for you it just depends on how much time do you have to spend on sim how much time can you spend understanding the logs analyzing it and then correlating it with different tools right now then let's move on right so dark of the moon so we have had a lot of serious conversation this is just to lighten up the things right uh, this is a typical day in a sock analyst life that once you have set up your sim you have all the logs up and running coming into your sim you have set up all those fantastic rules there is this problem all those sims are very fantastic in giving you a lot of alerts or alarms the only thing they are bad at is justifying is this a false positive or is this a true positive that is something where it comes to the sock analysts wits right that is this really something that i need to work with or is this something that i can ignore and fine tune so again it is subject to how much you understand the log how much you understand the infrastructure the needs of the infrastructure and all those things yeah so this is something that we can explore in some other conversation some other day in detail how do you work with the false positives right how do you work your way through the false positives so that you get very efficient alerts for you yeah but yeah to give you a very generic overview if you have a lot of data coming in from a lot of places then it's most likely that you will have a lot of false positives also yes you fine tune it with time obviously you learn with time you understand the needs of your organization and then fine tune it accordingly but yeah in general you'll see a lot of alerts and accordingly a lot of false positives but then you'll have to say this is fine you're a sock analyst right so this is your job and obviously you'll end up having more and more data ingested into your sim because this is the thing about security or this is the thing about logging if someone ever asks you how much logging is enough or how much logging do you think is enough for sim my answer is the more the better the more logs i have the more visibility i have into the network so uh, no there is no stopping in getting you more and more logs into sim the more the better that is 
basically the moon mool mantra right yeah this is how you work your way through the false positives you fine tune them you end up getting more and more data into it and then you create some very specific rule with time as you learn your network and the needs this is the last topic now this is the last topic now on to this webinar we'll just spend 5 minutes now we'll probably end in 15 minutes so attack matrix and how does it help it helps you in understanding the ttps uh, it's a very good open source library if you have not explored it yet here is the link click on this links and then you would understand that what i am talking about it has a very big matrix where there are a lot of small blocks you click in one block it will take you to one particular type of a malware so it will talk about the malware itself how is it used to exploit and what do you want to monitor in terms of events and processes if you want to detect that particular malware so this is very very interesting it works on the basis of uh, lockheed martin kill chain which has the seven steps Re starting from recon weaponize deliver exploit command and control or c2c execute and maintain if i were to take a very quick example of this so let's say if you want to rob a bank how do you plan it this is where you know the kill chain comes into play so first of all you recon the bank what's a recon a recon method is you just go around the bank physically and see all the defenses which are set up because you are the adversary nobody knows that you are going to attack it unless you start the attack so you have this privilege where you can go up close and then see the defenses that is reconnaissance or fingerprinting once you have done the reconnaissance once you have identified the weak spots where you can break in then you weaponize then you choose the weapon of your interest that you think would be the most effective once the weapon is chosen you deliver the the strike and then you exploit the vulnerability be it the guard be it there's a hole in the building or something like that or there's a back door entrance or something like that you exploit the vulnerability and then you establish your command and control there could be somebody on the outside once you are in you need to talk to him to coordinate and then you execute your real work like shipping out money or something like that whatever your end goal is you execute it right and then you maintain your foothold for further instructions that is how you rob a bank so that is how any sort of exploit goes on or any malware cam campaign operates in general so it's really good mapping out the steps of any campaign on generic level once you have mapped out the steps then it will be so much clearer for you to understand where you can detect these things is it possible to detect somebody while he is trying to recon very difficult is it possible for somebody when he is trying to exploit yes this is relatively easier because now he is already inside so you already have everything that you need to get started with the investigation right because you cannot stop people from looking so detecting somebody at the reconnaissance level is very difficult similarly if you have a shop on the road side you cannot stop people from looking at the shop but if somebody is trying to deliver a strike to your shop then just obviously there you can stop them proactively right that is what the attack matrix talks about i will also show it towards the end of this slide right so it talks about tactics techniques and procedures something which i have been talking about the ttps this helps the sock guys understand how to fortify the defenses against the hacker what i mean by that is having a tool is one thing using it efficiently is another let's say if you have a firewall but is it working in the most efficient manner that is another question let's say if you have an antivirus or an edr solution for you it, are you utilizing it to the full extent are you using all the functionalities if not then there is something that that you can do okay so this is the attack matrix right so this is the last slide for today probably the most important one so if i get into conversation with any anybody who's trying to start or jump start into cyber security i dearly advise them to work on these three things or two things first thing is the networking should be good with your networking if not the routing protocols i don't expect you to be a bgp level expert or a ospf level expert rather i want you to know how an ip address works what's a vlan how segmentation is works right what super networking and sub networking and all those major concepts so that you know that wherever there is a ip address range or if there is an ip address you know that what sort of an ip is it the second part is the major protocols which include smtp to send and receive emails dns to query different hosts dhcp to assign ip address in a network kerberos for windows authentication 
net bios for name identification into windows and smb to transfer files between linux and windows but the major protocols are not limited to these but yeah if you at least have knowledge about these which i have just mentioned i think you would do just fine as a soc analyst or as a red teamer also you should have the knowledge about these things. http protocol very important https is nothing but http with ssl right so you need to know ssl what is it how does it work how is it implemented okay so ssl and http these are the two things which you should know the headers and the methods like http protocol uses get method post method delete method put method to send and receive request right so it's all about the parameters which are used into the methods which the hackers exploit so being a blue teamer if you know about those parameters in advance then you can run your research there again the same thing right you can write more efficient rules which can detect a lot more things into the web applications workspace last but not the least operating system level basics of windows and linux because everything in cyber security well almost everything is linux so at least you should know that black and white screen and how to fire a command to do something like file manipulation that is the first thing they should do create a file delete a file modify a file change the permission of a file you should know this how do i transfer the file yeah and all those things then user manipulation create a user assign a user to a process delete a user and all those things and basic services that is something that you should know into windows and linux together this will work as a solid foundation for all your investigations right on to the right there is a small joke batman gets a new virus a spyware malicious code a phishing from different people why he is able to detect everything because he is the batman you might not be able to detect all these things without prior knowledge of all these things that i have written in the left right so he might be able to detect everything because he is a special case if you want to be as good as him you need to start studying into all these basic things that is the message here okay thank you so much for being such a patient audience today and listening to me for the last one and a half hours and thank you so much for joining in today